But if you have your Bibles, turn with me to third chapter of Genesis. Yes, we're starting at the beginning. And uh, again, I'd like to thank Sister Christine Saylor. She's not here right now. Uh, she's got her hands full with some youngins. Uh, but, um, but those of you that uh, follow the church on Facebook, follow me on Facebook, know that uh, today we're going to talk about it's not my fault. See, it's not my fault. You know, maybe, maybe this is a sermon on good and bad or good and evil or whatever you want to talk about it, but I started going back and I started looking, and that was way too big a message to preach. I would have kept you here for a long time. Now, don't get me wrong. A couple weeks ago, I preached for 40 minutes, and I was told about it. Uh, <laughs> but it is what it is. Uh, but uh, but as we go back to Genesis, it's not my fault. Uh, we can read... Um, the third chapter, the first 11 verses of the third chapter, and then we'll get into the message. So if you're able to stand for the word, and uh, it said, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field with the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall eat of every tree of the garden. So he already started lying to them because they knew they weren't. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So God told him, Don't do this or you're going to die. But anyway, it said, the fourth verse, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Isn't that just like the devil? Lie to you. He twists the truth, even though the Lord tells us in black and white what's going on. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Did you do what I told you not to do, Adam? And the man said, The woman whom you, that thou gavest to me to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. You know, it's not my fault. The woman did it. And the Lord said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, or tricked me, and I did eat. It's not my fault. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you once again for the privilege of being in the house of God. We thank you, Lord, for the word that you've given us to lead us, to guide us, to teach us in all ways, to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And Lord, we ask that you anoint us as we bring forth the word of God, Lord, that we could anoint it and be anointed and say the words you would have us to say. Anoint the ears of people to hear this word, that they could hide it in their heart, Lord, that they may not sin against you. Lord, if, we, if there be anything that would hinder this message, we bind it in the Christ's name. And we pray for those that aren't here with us today. We pray for those that are sick. We ask, Lord, that you meet them at the very point of their need. Whatever it may be, body, mind, or spirit, Lord, we ask that you minister to them at the very point of their need. In Christ's precious holy name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. So the first two verses of Genesis says, In the beginning, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So, in the beginning, life was formless. There was no order to it. There was nothing going on. There was chaos in the garden. There was chaos. And, you know, so it said that God created chaos, created order out of the chaos, and brought everything, and he did everything that he said there in the first chapter. And when he finished, what did he say? It's good. It's good. I've done all that. See, but not everybody was happy because the Bible tells us about Satan. He believed that, you know, I ought to get more credit for, than I'm getting. I believe I'm as strong as God. I believe I'm as smart as God. I believe everything else. And he rebelled against God and took a third of the angels. And he was banished to the earth. And he was banished. But God, God had given control of the earth to Adam and Eve. He had given control of earth to man. But he had banished Satan down there. So Satan's like, well, I can't hurt God. But I know who I can't hurt. I'll hurt him by proxy. I'll hurt him by proxy. I'll hurt him by, you know, getting, getting Adam to do something or getting Eve to do something. See, if somebody can't hurt you, what do they do? 
They go after your kids. They go after your family. They go after somebody close to you. Because if you're tough, if you're big enough, or you're too big to hurt or too big to insult or whatever, they'll go after your kids. And I'm here to tell you, they go after your kids, he'll get to you quicker if they go after you. In the same way here, so Satan came around so, and started creating confusion where God had put order. As we go through our life today, as we start looking around the globe, as we start looking around this country, it doesn't, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that Satan's done a pretty good job of creating chaos. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that he has started creating chaos where God had once had order. You know, there's confusions around the roles of men and women. There's confusions around the roles of husbands and wives. There's confusion around the roles of mother and father. We don't... We don't seem to know what those roles are anymore you know as we go through young people are confused about their place in the family young people are confused about their place in society they don't know what their role should be they don't know the things that are going on and so as that happens young people start getting in various stages of rebellion against against order they get in rebellion against authority they get in rebellion at school they get in rebellion at home because they don't know what their roles are they're trying to figure that out and society hasn't helped them at all because of all this stuff about homosexuality homosexuality, LGBTQT, this role, that role. We, we got all kinds of confusion. Everybody just wants to know what their identity is, and they're looking for an identity in some place other than their identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we'll never be happy until we know who we are in Christ Jesus. We'll never be happy until we know what our identity is in the family of God. Until we come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, we'll never know what's going on. We'll never understand why we have to go through what we go through until we know who we are in Christ. So all, these conf all this confusion, all this chaos has been brought about by Satan. Pure and simple. And it's getting more and more and more confusing. See, the last few elections have been a big deal about abortion. Why? There's confusion about the value of life. Either you value life or you don't. Either you want to go by what the Word of God says or you don't. The next thing we'll be dealing with, and we've already dealt with it, how many people remember Dr. Kevorkian? Euthanasia. Why? Because we don't value life. Because we don't value life. We think that's, you know, if we don't value life as a society, we better sure value life as a church, as a body of believers, as a body of Christ. We need to know what our role is. We need to start trying to create order according to the Word of God with the help of God in, in our families, in our communities, in our churches. We, we need to tell a world that there is a heaven to get to and there's a hell to miss. And I know I sound like a broken record, but I'm going to preach it until I'm blue in the face that there is a heaven to get to and there's a hell to miss and there's only one way to get there and that's through and by the blood of Jesus Christ Amen. there can't be any confusion about our roles in society as Christians there can't be any confusion about our roles in our homes as Christian mothers and fathers and husbands and wife we need to know what it is we need to get back to our identity in God so but think about for a second what Satan got just for a few bites of forbidden fruit think about what he got see he really got a lot he really got a lot for a few bites of that you know he got control of the world he got control of the world God had given control he gave man dominion over everything that's what the Bible said man had control of all this but we gave it up for a few bites of fruit you know long after the flavor was forgotten Long after the crunchiness was forgotten. That may have been the best tasting fruit in the world, Brother Johnny. Oh, it might have been awesome. And I got news for you. My wife got some cuties, of those little bee clementines, a few weeks ago. Oh, they were awesome. I'm like, get some more of those next time you go to the store. She got some more. They weren't as good. I've been chasing that really good clementine for four weeks now. I've been chasing that really good thing. See, sometimes the next bite isn't always as good as the first bite was. Sometimes the next bite isn't always as good. So think about that. See, we're still paying the price thousands of years later for the, excuse me, stupid mistake that Adam and Eve made. And sometimes in our life, we pay the price for unwise decisions that we make in our life. We pay the price for years and years, sometimes for generations and generations. We get bound by generation just because of an unwise decision because we have a distorted sense of value, because we don't know what our identity is. We've allowed chaos to creep into our family and into our family tree. See, the, Satan depends on us 
make an unwise decision. He depends on us making unwise decisions. Back through the Bible, we see Achan traded his life for a wedge of gold in a Babylonian garment. We see Esau traded his entire birthright. Everything that, everything that his brother Jacob ended up with, got, he got tricked out of for a bowl of bean soup. He got tricked out of it for a bowl of bean soup. All those things, you know, we go through there, and just for one sensual moment with Bathsheba, David brought curse on his family for generations and generations. The kingdom of Israel was never the same after that moment. The kingdom of Israel was on upward rise, and it was so high, people were paying them money just to not attack them. But for one moment, you know, Satan's always doing that. He's always offering something, but it's not very much. But, you know, we think we're getting a good deal. We think we're getting a good deal. We think, you know, we've, we've pulled one over on him. We've got a good deal for this little bite of the apple. We've got a good deal, but just for a moment of pleasure, a moment of economic gain, a moment of notoriety, a moment of some applause, something like that. We give up all that, for, we give up all that just because of one little bite of fruit. We give up our identity. We give up our order. We give up everything that we have in Christ Jesus for one little bite of forbidden fruit, for one little thing that God said, did you eat of that tree? Well, you know, See, we try to find somebody else to blame, just like Adam and Eve. It's human nature. We try to find somebody else to blame. See, as we go through that, that eighth verse there in that third chapter, you know, it, it starts off, it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord walking, Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves. They knew they'd done wrong, so they hid. See, when we make a mistake, we know it. If we go against the word, that conscience that we got, the Holy Ghost, that little unction, something will tell us, something will condemn us and say, hey, you messed up. You went against the word of God. See, that's why it's so important to apply daily word to your life so we know what the expectations of God are, so we know what he's asking us to do. So that way, when we do something wrong, that Holy Ghost quickens us, and we need to get right back to the altar and go, Lord, I messed up. But instead, a lot of people run off and hide in the trees. They go hide. Oh, I messed up. They're ashamed. They don't want to admit it. See, they've allowed chaos to sneak in. And that night verse says, And the Lord God called on them, Adam and said, Where art thou? And he goes, I heard, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Well, who told you you were naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree where I have commanded thee that thou should not eat? That is what is called a rhetorical question, because God knew good and well they had ate of that fruit. I just want to see if you'll come clean. Did you eat what I told you not to eat? Did you? How many times you had that conversation with your kid? You know in good well what the truth is, but you're going to ask them. Did you do it? You know in good and well they did it. You just want to see. So God gave Adam a chance to straighten it out. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to me, to be with me, she gave me the tree and I did eat. You know, Lord, it's not my fault. Don't blame me. I didn't do it. It was that woman. In the 13th verse, it said, And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Well, it, it wasn't my fault. Don't blame me. It's not my fault. The serpent tricked me. See, we always want to go around when something's wrong with us, when we've committed a sin or we've done something wrong and we're found out, we always want to blame somebody else. We want to say, oh, it's not my fault. You know, it's that woman you gave me. Or this, you know, I, you know, I, I was tricked. I was tricked. They, they, you know, it, it's, it happened. But God gave him one command. Eve knew what the command was. She, she answered the serpent, hey, we're allowed to eat of any of the tree of the garden except for the one in the middle of the garden. He said, we die. There are consequences to breaking the word that God has given you. And they did. You know, we see that they lived over 900 years, but they still died. Sin came into the garden. Men had to work for their living. Instead of just stuff happening, they could have just walked around and enjoyed life. It's been an eternity of retirement, a good retirement, but it wasn't. And women had to suffer labor pains because of this. And there's a lot of other curses that go along. See, when we mess up in our life and we try to blame somebody else, there are things that are going to happen in our life that are a result of what we did. There are things going to happen to our, an uh, our descendants as a result of what we did. <coughs> so let's look at some of the ways we use 
blame or how we blame somebody else because it's not our fault when we sin. Well, that's just the way I am. Well, that's just the way I am. You know who I am. Yeah, my wife just back here shaking her head. She has heard this on more than one occasion. You know, somebody has a violent temper. You know, they scream and holler at their kids or their wife or maybe even uh, do some physical abuse. But, you know, it's not my fault. That's just kind of how I am. You know, so when he gets mad, the kids run and lock their doors and the wife runs and hides or cries or whatever. But, you know, that's, that's just who I am. I, I can't help it. You know, I can't. But the Bible keeps telling us, hey, you're accountable for your actions. It doesn't matter who your mom was. It doesn't matter who your dad was. It doesn't matter who you were raised. You, 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 you get a choice in how you act. You get a choice in the actions that you do. We, we can have all kinds of feelings, all kinds of thoughts, all kinds of stuff go through our mind. But ultimately, it's us who decides how to carry out those actions associated with those thoughts and feelings we are responsible for our actions we can't just go that's the way i am well there's some people my my, i'd rather have somebody get mad and scream at me than get all swole up and sullen they go around pouting lip pooched out walk around like that for weeks just hoping somebody notice what's wrong with you they're hoping somebody what's wrong with you they get they're hoping somebody ask them and why do you get, why are you all swollen? Why why are you feeling all, well, that's just the way I am. I just get my feelings hurt and I just want to sulk. Anybody like that? Ain't no fun to deal with those kind of people. Like I said, I'd rather have somebody scream at me, get it over with. Scream at me, get mad. And that's just the way you are. But you know, we walk around like that. Don't blame me. Don't blame me. That's it's not my fault. That's just the way I am. God made my personality. Get used to it. That's just who I am. That's my identity. Well, you know, we could blame anybody else but us. We still have responsibility for our own actions. We can walk around or we can go, hey, let's do this the Bible way. You hurt my feelings. Let's talk about it. Second thing, it's somebody else's fault. It's somebody, if you knew the kind of, kind of family I grew up in, if you knew that I was being bullied by kids at school all my life, if you knew that my dad lost his temper all the time, if you knew my mom, my mom sucked around all the time, it's their fault. It's just the way I was raised. You know, and so these people go into counseling to find out why they're like they are. And that's, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to, well, I am going to talk bad about secular counseling. Just buckle up. <laughs> just buckle up. Psychiatrists and psychologists try to get to the root of why you act the way you are. And it's real easy. It's, I think it's important to know the, the factors that you know, made you who you are. I think it's important to know the trauma and the stuff in your background so that you can identify it, so that you can identify it and make order out of a chaotic situation. But at the same time, if you're all the time pointing blame at somebody else and not accepting responsibility for yourself, then you're not going to get any better. You're not going to change. You're not going to improve. As long as you want to blame somebody else to make an excuse for your actions, then you're never going to change. Again, we are responsible for our actions. We are responsible for the things that we do. We need to understand those relationships. We need to understand those traumas. We need to understand all that stuff. But we are responsible for our own actions. How many times have you heard somebody, well, I'd quit smoking, but everybody around me smokes. If they would just quit, then it would be easier for me to quit. It's their fault that I'm still smoking. I, can't, I just can't be around them without doing it. Well, I'd quit getting drunk all the time if my friends would stop drinking. But, you know, that's how they party, So, and I like to be with them. So, you know, when in Rome, do as Roman. No, it's not that way. You can't blame anybody else for the actions that you've got. You've got to stand up and take a responsibility for the way, the way you think, the way you act, and all that stuff. Again, you can have any kind of thought that go through here, but it's eventually what happens here, here, and here that comes out between your teeth that is your responsibility. Stop blaming somebody else. It's real easy. Well, I, I know all those things are wrong, but it's somebody else's fault. If they would just do better, I would do better. If they would treat me better, I would treat them better. <laughs> Baloney. The devil made me do it. Oh, it, it wasn't my fault. It's not my fault. The devil made me do it. How many people remember Flip Wilson? I'm dating myself. I'm old. All right. Remember he dressed up as Geraldine? Oh. 
and do something. Well, the devil made me do it. And there was even shirts around in the 70s had that on. The devil made me do it. See, uh, things happen when all else fails as a last resort. Well, if I can't blame my parents, if I can't blame my upbringing, if I can't blame being bullied, if I can't blame it to just that's who I am, then let's blame the devil. He just made me do it. See, a lot of times we find all kinds of reasons. There's a story. They did an ESPN uh, 30 for 30 on it, and I like sports. And it was about football, so I really watched it. And it was, a, it was about a high school in uh, Texas, 1988. Carter High School, just outside of Dallas, Texas. They won the state championship. I mean, they literally won the state. They beat people by 40, 50 points a game, went undefeated. They had, they had most of their team had Division I scholarships. I still remember in 1988, ESPN was like five, six years old. One of their guys signed a letter of intent to play for Texas sitting in a hot tub with enough gold. He had a Mr. T starter set around his neck, and he signed his letter of intent sitting in a hot tub. That was a baller thing to do, man. I mean, really. <laughs> but he sat there, and I was like, well, this is a 17-year-old kid just, you know, has the world. Three days after they won the state championship, set all kinds of Texas high school records. Three days, they put on stockings over their heads, and most of the team, in groups of three, began robbing restaurants and jewelry stores and convenience stores, and they started, they had a crime spree in this little town in Texas. There was 23 different robberies over the course of three or four weeks, and they got caught. And the judge went, lit them up. The judge gave them sentences anywhere from two, two years to 25 years because they used a 22 and a couple semi-automatic weapons. And, you know, they thought because they were football players, they were untouchable. And when the judge handed down the sentence, everybody started crying, and everybody started, oh, you can't do this. They're 17 and 18-year-old kids. But they were responsible for their own actions. They were responsible. And the judge said, it doesn't matter. We're not going to blame society for their problems. We're not going to blame who they are for their problems. They did these things, and the quarterback was the only one that stood up and said, we did this to ourselves." It is our fault, and we deserve all the punishment that we get. He goes, I wish if we could go back, we could change it, but it's us that made these decisions. The only one mature enough to do that. Everybody else was crying and carrying on. We don't deserve this. We don't deserve this. When something happens, the first thing we want to do in society is blame the accused. Well, they had it coming, or they brought it on themselves or did something else. We never want to hold somebody accountable. When that young man went into that movie theater and shot up that movie theater, the first thing we said, well, he was raised really rough, and you know he was an outcast of society, and he shouldn't have been able to get a gun. Let's blame the guns. No. How about we hold people accountable for the things that they do? because that's what God does he holds us accountable for the things we do we can't blame somebody else we can't say it's just the way I am we can't say the devil made me do it we can think of a lot of things to do that but it, basically it boils down to blah 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 because that's what God hears he doesn't hear all the excuses you can blah 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 till you're blue in the face but God doesn't hear all the excuses in John the 8th chapter the 44th verse Let's listen to what the Bible teaches about Satan. It says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. See, Satan is a liar, and the father of it, it says. See, when people say the devil made me do it, well, that's a lie. See, he deceived Eve in that third chapter of Genesis. He tricked her. He lies all the time. So why does he lie? Why does he deceive? Why does he tempt? Why does he manipulate? Well, for the plain and simple reason is because he can't force you. See, if he could force you to sin, it'd be over with. If he could force us to sin, he'd be over. He'd just force us to sin, have us killed, and he'd be done with us. But he can't force us to sin. We are still responsible for our own actions. If I were to, if I were to, lead, if I were to lead you out to the edge of a cliff, and you're looking over it, and we're having a conversation, and I tap you on the shoulder, I go, I've got your child, and unless you jump, I'm going to beat him, I'm going to mutilate him, I'm even going to kill him. And you think for a minute, 
And because you love your child, you take a jump. And as you jump, I'm going, I was just kidding! Did I, did I make you jump? No. Did I push you off the cliff? No. I manipulated you. I lied to you. I teased you. And that's what Satan does. He, he lies to you. He teases you. He manipulates you until the point that you do something. But you still have the responsibility. You are still accountable for your actions. He may lie. He may say, oh, I was just kidding. But by the time you've taken a bite of the apple, you've already given up all the control. You've already given up all the order. You've brought chaos back into your life because you made a decision, a conscious decision to do that. I didn't force you to jump. Satan can't force us to sin. See, nobody tied Eve down and made her eat that apple. Didn't, didn't tie her, didn't shove it in her mouth, didn't cut up a little bite-sized pieces. Didn't, didn't hide it in another piece of fruit like we do with medicine for our dog. Hide it in something else so they'll take the medicine. No, they, he, he, he said, hey, you're not going to die. He just tricked you. See, nobody forced you to get involved in any immorality. Nobody forces you to sin. Nobody forces you to lie. Nobody forces you to steal. It's just those little bitty temptations. And we have the responsibility for our own actions. We have that responsibility. All right, well, if I can't blame mom and dad, if I can't blame that's just who the way I am, if I can't blame the devil, then who can I blame? Well, how about blaming God? After all, God's the one that puts you in the family you're in. Any? God's the one that gave you the awful circumstance that you're in. Well, God's the one that allowed the bullying. People want to blame God for their situation. The hurts in their life, the trouble in their life, the financial situation. Sometimes our financial situation is simply a, a result of some of the decisions we made 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. We took a bite out of the apple back then, and now we're dealing with the consequences of it. Our health concerns. Sometimes we took a bite out of the apple 10, 20, 30 years ago, and now we're dealing with those consequences. See, we want to blame somebody else. See, we even want to blame God. How many times do you want to blame God for something? But God says, I made a propitiation for your sin. You get to choose whether you want to go to heaven or hell. I sent a sacrifice for you once and for all. He made a way of escape for us. He loved us enough that he sent his only begotten son to die for us, that we could have life and have it more abundantly. See, we go through all these things and we suffer all these things and we think, oh, but you know, we need to understand that there are certain things in our life that we have to be responsible for. God will help us bring order back into our life, but we got to bring God back into our life in order for that to happen. We've got to get back to the Bible and stop blaming people because that doesn't do any good. 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, the ninth verse. It says, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. See, there's going to be times in our life that we're going to have to be held responsible for what we do, good or bad. He said, we're all going to be in the judgment seat. We're all going to be standing before the judgment seat. We can't blame mom, can't blame society, can't blame the devil, can't blame our personality. We'll have nobody. We'll stand there just like Adam in the garden. Lord, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. Uh, that woman you gave me. No, that's not going to work, Adam. She didn't shove it down your throat. Well, she gave it to me. She didn't shove it down your throat. He made a decision on his own. See, now that's the bad news. All right, what's the good news? Well, Christ loved us and died for us. That's good news, plain and simple. He loved us and died for us. See, the first thing in being covered by the blood of Jesus Christ is believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, that he shed his blood for you and I, that he went into a tomb and took the keys of death, hell, and the grave from Satan, and on the third day he arose, and he's sitting on the right hand of the Father making intercession for those of us that believe. He's praying for us. Now imagine that. Jesus is praying for us. He's sitting there praying for those of us. See, so all we have to do is, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me. I messed up. It's not anybody's fault. It's my fault. I'm the one that messed up. But, you know, there's a... A story I believe I've told before, and if you turn to the 13th chapter of Luke, as they're coming to the thing, 
uh, Donald, Barnhor Donald Barnhorse told this story about a prairie fire that ran through his dad's farm when he was a kid. And it burned everything. Burned the house, burned the barn, burned the silo, burned the windmill down, burned all the outbuildings, chicken coop, everything, burned everything. It was just charred ground as far as the eye could see. And his dad was walking through, through the, the yard and he saw what he thought was a burnt stump sitting on the ground. He's like, there wasn't a tree there. And he walked over to it and he kicked it. And it flipped over and baby chicks ran everywhere. It was a mother hen that had brought her chicks under her wings and she took the brunt of that fire to protect her kids. And Jesus said in the 13th chapter of Luke, the 34th verse, it said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets and stoneth them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. See, Jesus, no matter how bad we are, that killed the prophets, stoned the prophets that came to minister to them, how often would he have gathered us under his wings to protect us from the storms of life, from the fires of life, from the temptations of life, from the trials of life. He has made a way for us to escape all of that, and we don't have to blame anybody because he is bringing order back to our life. Let's all stand. As they, they play, sing, whatever they're going to do, I'm tired of the chaos in this world. I'm tired of the roles that are confused. I'm tired of the lies that are brought about on TV. I'm tired of all that. It is time for the remnant of God to stand up and tell the world about Jesus Christ. And the only way we could do that is if we, we're walking around with clean hands and pure hearts. Let's all come around the altar and have a good season of prayer.